discovery from deep within the mountains of China. 12,000 year old ancient stone discs with an encrypted message from extraterrestrials called the Dropa. Some believe they tell an amazing story. There was an alien crash landing. Did aliens visit China thousands of years ago? Is there a connection to today's UFO sightings? I named it the Chinese Roswell. Is the Chinese government hiding evidence of extraterrestrial contact? The Drop of Stones is the strangest UFO story I've ever encountered. Join us as we uncover the truth behind China's Roswell. The story of the mysterious Dropa Discs begins deep within China's Bayan Kara Ula Mountains. There, a 1938 archaeological expedition led by Chai Pu Te reportedly arrived to study a series of interconnected caves. What they are said to have found was far more intriguing. In a cave uh, allegedly found a row, row upon row, or several rows of of what looked like graves. But these were no ordinary graves. Inside these graves were many skeletons buried. Skeletons with big heads, big and clumsy heads, and with fragile bones. And in addition on the walls, we are told that there were images uh, of these stick figures of presumably these beings, these short beings with the large heads, with images of the sun, moon, and stars. He also found 716 stone disks, one feet in diameter, and they were about one or one and a half centimeters thick. These have become known as the Dropa Stones. And these round stone disks had a black hole in the center, some of them have a rectangular notch engraved in them, not cut out. Some of the notches were cut out, others were just engraved. And then they found a spiraling groove of closely written ancient characters like hieroglyphics radiating out from the center. It is told that uh, the expedition of Mr. Chipote brought a lot of these stone disks to Beijing because he had been in the Beijing Academy of Sciences. According to believers, the Dropa stones were filed away with other items from antiquity. Some 20 years later, one scientist became interested in deciphering the hieroglyphs on the stones. It must have been at the end of the 50s, 1958 or 1959, when a Professor Zum Um Nui came upon these discs again, and what he could decipher was a very weird story. It was on the stones that Sung Un Nui is said to have deciphered the name of the extraterrestrials. They call themselves the Dropa. The name of the Dropas was written down on those stone disks. And the story was as follows, that there was an alien crash landing in Western, what is now Western China, 12,000 years ago. Dr. Nui purportedly faced opposition when it came time to publish his findings. In 1960 or 61, Professor Tsum Nui published his reportings uh, from his deciphering of the hieroglyphs. And the title was something like Hieroglyphs, which are telling the story of spacecraft crash landed in the Bayan Karaula Mountains in central China. Most of his colleagues thought it's an absolute nonsense. And so Professor Tsum Um Nui became very frustrated and not long after his publication, he emigrated to Japan. However, the harsh reaction from the academic community in China did not silence the Dropa Stone story. A handful of magazines published articles about Dr. Nui's work, keeping the remarkable story of the stones alive. The first magazine, which was 
publishing this story was the Russian Sputnik magazine. A Sputnik magazine has been in the early 60s a magazine reporting interesting items from behind the Iron Curtain. After the Sputnik article, researchers say that the story spread around the world. In 1962 or 63, the Belgian UFO investigator and then German publication, The Vegetarian Universe, they brought the same story again. Until the year 1974, these articles inside the magazines were the only informations we had. It has never been possible to go to China in those years and to ask if the story is true. But some ufologists, people who research and study possible alien visitation, claim that the Dropa tale was kept alive by oral tradition in the Bayan Kara Ula. There are some old myths in those uh, mountains which are telling the story of these small, tiny people crash landing from the sky. Some of the legends claim that the Dropa came from a star system called Sirius. The ancient story tells that their ancestors came from the star system of Sirius 12,000 years ago. Some of the earliest gods and goddesses who came to Earth, according to legend, from the star Sirius, for example, in, in, in ancient Egypt, you have the goddess Isis, the embodiment of the star Sirius. The pyramids of Egypt were built in alignment with the star Sirius. The theory that ancient gods were actually space aliens is common among ufologists. Author Matthew Hurley has studied the god as space alien idea for over a decade. Throughout history, looking at many cultures around the world, we often hear of beings coming down from the sky and we often read of imagery of UFOs. To primitive humans, the technologically advanced visitors could have easily been mistaken for gods. They would have arrived in their ancient spacecraft. They would have had an unusual appearance. They would have spoken with a lot of wisdom and knowledge. So primitive man would have been overwhelmed by these experiences and may well have fallen into the trap of worshiping them as gods. Today, we are left with only two verifiable photographs and a fantastic tale, supposedly written in alien hieroglyphs. In 1938, a Chinese archaeological expedition to the isolated Bayan Karaula Mountains allegedly made an amazing discovery. Inside a series of caves that have never been located again, they are said to have found oddly shaped skeletons and hundreds of mysterious stone disks, now known as dropa stones. Some say that they also discovered etchings of the sun, stars, and other celestial bodies carved on the cave walls. And he saw the planets of our solar systems and other stars, and some of them connected with lines made from points. Something like a star map. In the caves, they find uh, pea-sized dots connecting the planet Earth to a distant star system, pointing towards the origin of the visitors. Are the alleged star map etchings proof that aliens were in the Bayan Kara Ula 12,000 years ago? UFO researcher and author Matthew Hurley maintains that ancient art from all over the world may provide evidence that early man was contacted by extraterrestrials. When we look at the cultures around the world and they all talk of beings coming down from above in their creation myths. The fact that we have the depiction of UFOs in artworks going back through the epochs to me strongly suggests ET and UFO visitation throughout the centuries. The earliest examples cited by Hurley date to primitive cave art over 30,000 years old. Initially, I believe ancient man would have used a branch and maybe scraped patterns in the mud. But then eventually he got hold of minerals such as manganese oxide and ochre and was able to construct beautifully executed images on cave walls of which we're familiar today, such as hunting scenes and bison and so forth. 
Early man also drew pictures of the natural world, including the sky. Man would have been looking up at the sky. It would have provided a permanent backdrop to his day-to-day -day living as it does for us today. And he would have observed the passage of the stars and heavenly bodies as the days went on. Man's fascination with the heavens has remained a common theme in art throughout the centuries. But Hurley sees unexplainable objects in many works of art that he believes may be extraterrestrials. This example is from an area of France known as Perche Mill. We've got these curious geometric triangular shaped objects. Here's an example of a petroglyph from Valcamonica in Italy, dated to 10,000 BC. And we've got two beings which are holding strange implements, and they have what appear to be helmets surrounding their heads. Interpretations from ufologists support that these images might be depictions of extraterrestrials, but even Hurley admits that other possibilities exist. I think we've got three possible explanations for these ancient artworks. They could well be real, and people were illustrating what they saw. They could well be fictional and were purely out of the individual's imagination. Or they could well be real beings, but maybe tribal leaders in some sort of ritual costume. But Hurley is unsure about the origins of the alleged Dropa Stones. I think what we may be looking at in those two photographs are either hoaxes which were done for the story, or they may well be jade by discs. Jade Bidis were created for the wealthy elite of China and they were placed in their tombs to protect them from demons. The Dropa stones do resemble Jade Bai discs, there's no getting away from that. In fact, the general design of the alleged Dropa stones, disc shaped with a hole in the center, has appeared in Chinese art for centuries. Thousands, if not tens of thousands, of these discs have been recovered from sites all over China from many time periods. There's nothing particularly unique about finding a flat disc with a hole in the center. Although the shape of the Dropa stones appears to be common to antiquity, the hieroglyphs on them were said to be otherworldly, the script of an alien hand. They were like characters from other languages. Uh, Mr. Chipote uh, thought it must be something like hieroglyphs. But some researchers find the hieroglyph story hard to believe. So these are discs that are allegedly 12,000 years old that have writing on them, that this Chinese scientist translated. This is very problematic. I mean, first of all, this is an achievement greater than the uh, the translation of the Rosetta Stone by Champollion in the 19th century. The Rosetta Stone was carved in 196 BC in Egypt and lists the good deeds of the pharaoh using three scripts, hieroglyphic, demotic, and Greek. Jean-Francois Champollion deciphered the scripts in 1822 after many years of study. His ability to read both Greek and Coptic helped him to figure out the writing on the Rosetta Stone. Some skeptics have noted the difficulty, if not impossibility, involved in deciphering scripts from unknown origins. He was able to decipher Egyptian hieroglyphics because there were two other languages that he, he knew. <laughs> so in this case, a Chinese scientist is able to decipher an allegedly pre-human language and tell a story. How would you be able to tell the difference between an alien hieroglyphic and an alien human civilization hieroglyphic? So I don't know what to make of this. There's nothing to make of it. It's just a story. But according to the Dropa legend, there was something extraordinary about the stones. That's why Russian scientists allegedly asked to examine them in the late 1960s. After testing the composition of the discs, the Russian scientists are said to have studied the general design of the Dropa stones. It was either 12 inches in diameter or 12 inches in circumference, possibly about like this, large or so, with a hole in the center where you could stick your finger through, and had emanating from the center going to the periphery, a spiral like a groove. To describe the Bayan Karaula stone discs, I can compare them with a modern long playing disc 
So, like phonograph LPs, the Russian scientists supposedly placed the discs on a turntable of sorts to play them. Suddenly, the oscillator showed an abrupt movement that looked like the stone discs had some electrical charge inside. The conclusion was that these stone discs must have been inside a very strong electrical field. Some ufologists allege that the electrically charged stones could have been used to send a vibrating message through space. Were the Dropa trying to phone home, like Steven Spielberg's marooned extraterrestrial in the 1982 movie E.T.? Why were the hieroglyphs written in a spiral pattern? The enigma of the stones persists. Peter Liu, a physicist at Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts, has studied the phenomena of spirals in the natural world. Anytime you want to simultaneously move, say, from the center of the circle while that circle is rotating, you get a spiral. We see logarithmic spirals on both animals and plants. In the animal kingdom, perhaps the most famous example is the chambered nautilus. Hurricanes, tornadoes, or spiral arrangements of storms. Like the swirling pattern of hieroglyphs on the alleged dropa stones, spirals are a common motif throughout art history. In Ireland at Newgrange, the entrance stone is covered with spirals. In China, about 3000 BC, we have these wonderful painted pots with artistically drawn spirals that have been made with a brush and ink. At about the same time, the Egyptians introduced hieroglyphics. They picked a spiral for the hieroglyphic character for the number 100. Spirals are an extremely common iconographic motif. We see them in a wide distribution through space and through time. And there's no reason to assume that it meant the same thing to everyone who drew one. Dropa has all the elements of a great science fiction story. Crashed UFOs, mysterious missing skeletons, and stone disks that are said to hold otherworldly secrets. If the account is true, extraterrestrials landed in China 12,000 years ago. Those who believe call it China's Roswell. You can compare these two stories, the Roswell UFO crash in 1947 and the Chinese Roswell that probably happened 12,000 years ago. You have probably alien spacecraft that has crash landed in an area. You have bodies that look similar in both cases, you have little people with big, clumsy heads and very tiny bones, very tiny skeleton. And as well, the proof of those crash landings has disappeared. And then the story went on and on and on through all the magazines, books, the internet. The story and the way it was covered bear striking similarities to the alleged alien crash site at Roswell, New Mexico. The Roswell incident really begins in the late 1970s when a documentary film about Roswell and other UFOs called UFOs Are Real uh, was picked up by the National Enquirer. It is true that in 1978 uh, there were stories in the National Enquirer that um, discussed Roswell and that this was one of the major ways that the story got its rebirth. Then you saw articles and television films about it and more books and more books. Then that's when the eyewitnesses started to come out of the woodwork and tell their story. That's when the Roswell incident really starts. Some UFO researchers agree that coverage in the tabloids seriously diminishes the believability and credibility of both the Roswell and Tropa accounts. It's been a real hindrance and um, it's unfortunate. Aside from being nearly impossible to find, the Dropa magazine sources have proven equally problematic, but for a variety of reasons. We are told that the original source for this was the Soviet magazine known as Sputnik. There is a, a German publication, a Vegetarian Universe, from July of 1962. There is a, apparently also a Belgian UFO publication. But they also had a, an account of this in 1962. These were very sensationalistic magazines, sort of uh, equivalents of the Star or the Enquirer and things like this. And who in, uh, in the vegetarian universe knew Chinese? The tabloid articles about Roswell and Dropa are just one of several similarities. For some, the parallels run much deeper. 
A government conspiracy. In the minds of ufologists, cover-up is another aspect that both Dropa and Roswell have in common. They often believe that the governments of the U.S. and China are hiding extraterrestrial technology and alien bodies. Moreover, they claim Chinese officials have tried to hide a race of human-alien hybrids. There are a lot of instances in which the Chinese government acts in such a way as to prevent itself from being embarrassed. It's not just government restriction that keeps tourists out of certain areas in western China. The land itself is vast, isolated, and often inhospitable. The Bayan Karaula is a mountain range in the Qinghai province in central China. It is as big as the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, with mountains ranging up until 20,000 feet. And in this area is only one major road crossing through. In the Bayan Karaula mountain range are people who have every day their fight against nature. People are primarily uh, herders. Um, they uh, raise a variety of different kinds of animals, horses, goats, uh, sheep. But there are those who believe this rustic setting holds a dark secret. A legendary village of dwarves. Hausdorff argues that a race of human-alien hybrids may live in a Chinese village called Weilong. Like Roswell, those who subscribe to the Dropa story think the Chinese government could be hiding extraterrestrials who crash-landed on Earth. But the difference to Roswell, New Mexico, is that in China, probably 12,000 years ago, some of them did survive. And the next question is, when there were survivors, could they still exist in our days? Not the survivors themselves, but their descendants, generations and generations after. Hausdorff says that the small statured residents of Wee Long may be the hybrid offspring of local humans and the marooned Dropa. There are press allegations that there were remarkably short people, apparently, that living in that part of China. The Chinese government alleges that what has led to their dwarfism is the uh, existence of contaminants in the environment. The theory was supported by a study conducted by the Chinese Academy of Science, which found toxins in the water supply. The results were widely published around the world. The environmental pollution is extreme in many, many parts of China. The water was adequately treated, and according to press accounts in 1997, no new cases of dwarfism have been reported since. Could the little people of Wee Long have inspired the entire Dropa story? The mystery gets even more intriguing with the discovery of a journal written under the name of Dr. Carol Robin Evans, a British explorer. In 1978, author David Agamon posthumously published The Travel Diary of Robin Evans as a book titled Sun Gods in Exile. And this book described a journey to the, the Dropa region uh, that Evans had allegedly made where he encountered these dwarf-like people who said to him that they had ancestors who came from the stars. In 1947, English scientist Dr. Carl Robin Evans goes into the, the border of Tibet and China at the actual site and he studies the local language of the current Zopa people. Actually, the book Sun Gods in Exile reads like a true story and it's very thrilling. It's about those people coming through uh, space with a spacecraft and crash landed here on Earth. It turns out that there's there's no evidence that there was a Dr. Carol Robin Evans. No one can find this person or confirm that this person existed. David Agamon does exist or did exist, and um, uh, from what I understand, claimed that in later years that this was his own hoax or that there, he made up the name of Dr. Carol Robin Evans.
In the April 1998 edition of the popular British magazine Fortean Times, David Agamon did indeed admit that Sun Gods in Exile was a work of fiction. This book is a complete hoax. And in later years, David Agamon told the whole world, yes, this book is a hoax. Still, believers remain undaunted. I'm convinced there's a truth behind the stone disc story, but I know the book, Sun Gods in Exile, it is a hoax. Yet, like Roswell, the Dropa story continues to grow with time. And new evidence may have been discovered. Some say that mysterious Dropa stones, supposedly found in the Chinese mountains, were made by extraterrestrials who crash-landed on Earth 12,000 years ago. UFO researcher David Serrata believes that an astonishing video shot by the NASA space shuttle in 1996 shows mysterious objects shaped like dropa stones floating in space. Serrata thinks they are extraterrestrial spaceships that he calls NASA UFOs. There's a stunning resemblance to these dropa stones and the NASA UFOs. And this stone disc with a round hole in the center, a rectangular notch cut out of the side, and a spiraling groove of ancient written characters, which was identical to what we were seeing on the NASA tapes. This infrared footage, part of NASA's enormous catalog of space imagery available to the public for review, was shot from the Space Shuttle Columbia, mission STS-75. Dr. Stephen Walton, director of the Donald E. Bianchi Planetarium and astronomy professor at California State University, Northridge, remembers the mission. On this particular mission, there was an idea of being able to generate electricity by unwheeling a 12-mile long spool of wire downward from the space shuttle. But unfortunately, the wire broke, and the rod that you can see is the broken end of the wire. The objects appear to travel past the downed wire. This movement has convinced Serrata that they must be UFOs. These things were all moving at different velocities. They must have internal energy in them to be going different velocities. Walton has a different opinion. If you look at the times at which the debris seems to make sudden motions, you find out that those sudden motions occur at the same time as the space shuttle firing its thrusters. Although neither is certain about the strange pulsing spiral seen on the objects, each has a very different theory of what it could be. When I freeze frame the, the pulse, you actually see a spiraling wave radiating out from the center. When we get closer to the objects and we zoom in on them, we can see them strobing with these very curious energy waves. I don't think that the flashing has anything to do with electricity. It looks to me like it's a purely optical effect. In Dr. Walton's view, the objects in question are nothing more than optical illusions caused by the space shuttle's video camera. What you're seeing is probably a piece of debris tumbling in the sunlight and flashing on and off. That flashing on and off of this object interacts with the 30 frames per second that a video camera takes. A simple experiment by Walton may demonstrate this phenomenon. What I've got in my hand is a white plastic lid from a spray can. You can see that. And if we show that white object to the camera and then make the camera go very far out of focus, you will see that the unfocused image of this white object looks very much like a sort of donut-shaped object, kind of a spherical edge with a hole in the middle. But some true believers are not convinced. When you consider the hole in the center, the rectangular notch, and the spiraling wave, all identical when you look at them side by side to the NASA STS-75 UFO in 1996. You've got to ask yourself a lot of questions. If someone is going to convince me that extraterrestrials are visiting the Earth, a few unidentifiable points of light on a video are not particularly persuasive. Like Roswell, some ufologists see the STS-75 footage as more evidence of a U.S. government conspiracy to hide extraterrestrials. But conspiracy goes beyond borders. 
Could the communist government in China have suppressed an even more shocking truth? Just like the physical evidence that is said to have disappeared from the ranch in Roswell, New Mexico in 1947, the physical evidence relating to the Dropa Stones has seemingly disappeared. I've never heard that the Russian scientists gave back those Bayan Karaula stone disks to the Chinese. Very few people after this know what happened to some artifacts. Until perhaps 1974, when an Austrian engineer familiar with the Dropa story claimed to have made an amazing discovery in China. An Austrian engineer, uh, a certain Mr. Wegerer, came upon a small museum in Xi'an and he suddenly saw those stone discs exposed there. So he asked the curator of the museum, a lady, uh, what's about these stone discs? Oh, these stone discs are just cultural relics. Mr. Wegerer took photographs with a Polaroid camera. Some see Ernst Wegerer's photos as important physical evidence of the Dropa story. It is apparently a real photograph that does show discs, yes, but uh, they don't show any grooves. They don't show anything that you can identify as, as the Dropa discs. The only evidence we're left with is a series of these Polaroid photographs. So the question is, is this purely a hoax or is there something to it? Hausdorff claims to have spoken directly with the late Ernst Wegerer and was given the now famous Dropa Stone photographs. Because of the political climate in China at the time, Hausdorff was not allowed to visit the country until 1994. I came upon this Banpyo Museum and I could speak with a curator. I showed him the photographs. First he looked around himself and then he told me, oh, I've heard just a few days after this Austrian engineer was here in this museum. Both the former curator and the stone discs on exposure here, they disappeared. No one knows up to know where they have vanished to. The supposed disappearance of the stones has played into the conspiracy theories that now shroud the Dropa stones. Like the Roswell incident decades before, a handful of photographs remain. I think they are doing a cover-up. Imagine the story. It's about uh, some alien people uh, who experienced something like 1947 happened in Roswell, New Mexico. When you don't have physical evidence, you have to give some explanation for why you think your story is true, even though you can't prove it. One of the things that people do in that case is construct conspiracy theories. Consensus seems impossible concerning both Roswell and the Dropa incident. Secrecy may be a common denominator. What government in this world would admit the reality of such an uncanny story? And that's the reason why I think that the Chinese government is hiding those Dropa disks. This is utter nonsense. Whenever a spectacular scientific discovery or technological invention uh, is made, people don't go crazy, society doesn't fall apart. Researchers claim that they've had trouble locating key people and physical evidence to support the Dropa tale. You can't find any people or any bits of evidence. You can't find the paper that Sum Hum Nui supposedly wrote in 1962. This has never been found by anybody. Where is it? Um, the disks themselves are nowhere to be found. And if as is claimed in the documents, uh, there were actual bones of, of these people excavated by a Chinese archaeological team. Where are the bones? The difficulty of, of believing the story itself is primarily because of the inability of anyone to track any of these sources. Hausdorff claims in his book, The Chinese Roswell, that the Dropa Stones, along with key evidence, were lost or destroyed during the decade of upheaval known as the Chinese Cultural Revolution. In the 1960s, the violent cultural revolution swept China. Having slipped in the ranks of the Communist Party, Chairman Mao Zedong created the revolution to regain power of the country. Mao. 
He couldn't do it through the Communist Party. So he mobilized the youth. He created an extra party apparatus in the Red Guards to bombard the party members and to get his own forces to replace those folks. And to a large extent, that was really what the Cultural Revolution was about. The Red Guard lashed out at all aspects of traditional Chinese society. Here's a piece of the old feudal society. Ta -da 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 -da. Destroy it, bring it, destroy the statue, tear down the image of a god that uh, people used to believe in, or a saint, or something like that, in the, the belief that these things were holding China back. And a lot of really great stuff was destroyed as a result. Artwork, uh, religious images, historical texts and things that are quite clearly irreplaceable and uh, an enormous loss to the culture and tradition of, of the Chinese people. On September 9, 1976, Chairman Mao died. The Chinese Cultural Revolution ended shortly after. Could the Dropa Stones have been destroyed at the hands of Mao's Red Guard? Or did a courageous art lover stash the stones to prevent their destruction? We may never know for certain. The past is blurred behind a bamboo curtain, truth long buried in the chaos of revolution. It's difficult to tell fact from fiction, reality from fantasy. For many of these people, the facts are irrelevant. The belief in alien visitation is a matter of faith. No amount of contrary evidence is going to modify their beliefs because the facts don't matter. In the years following the Cultural Revolution, China struggled to regain some sense of normalcy. The main focus of life was no longer revolution. The borders opened and information poured in from the West, including the UFO craze that was sweeping America after close encounters of the third kind in 1977 and the publication of several books on Roswell. During the times of Mao Zedong, where they were communists, they were not allowed to get information about this. The communist ideology says all things come from Earth, such things as UFOs or alien people do not exist. But it didn't take long for the Chinese to catch on. By the late 1970s, people began to talk about and report UFO sightings. There appear to have been a fair amount of UFO sightings in China prior to the 1970s, but these were not really reported during the Mao years. After his death, around 1979 and 78, in fact, you start getting a degree of openness within China regarding of this topic. And there are a number of Chinese researchers looking into this phenomenon and then, as you would expect, dredging up stories from a lot of people who would say things like, oh, let me tell you what I saw five years ago or 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Today, there are more UFO sightings over China than anywhere else in the world. There have been a variety of reported sightings in China of UFOs. Are they genuine visitations by UFOs? I don't know, but they certainly have been witnessed by large numbers of people. You have to bear in mind that China's got over a billion people. So when you have two or three or a couple of thousand members of a UFO organization, that's not necessarily a huge amount. But there is uh, a core of very good, serious-minded people in China with true academic credentials who take this topic quite seriously. I think that's significant. Unlike in the US, UFO sightings in China are not only reported in tabloids, but in conventional newspapers as well. According to press accounts, modern China has the world's biggest network of UFO clubs, the China UFO Research Organization, and a monthly UFO magazine that sells 400,000 copies. Hobbyists and academics meet regularly to watch the skies and discuss UFO news. There are, in fact, UFO clubs now beginning to spring up in and around China. Perhaps uh, now UFOs are more interested in China and there are more of them going there.
The reason that UFO clubs are more popular in China is they now are free to think what they want and they now are very interested in UFOs and related items. Which brings us back to the question, is Dropa China's Roswell? I see them as absolutely totally different. I see Dropa as uh, most likely hoax, almost certainly hoax, let us say. And I see Roswell as something that has not yet been explained officially by the United States Air Force or government. I think people call Dropa the Chinese Roswell because it's sexy and gets better ratings and attention to people because Roswell's already known. Otherwise, it's a total nonsense, mythical story. Just like Roswell, abductions, small beings with oversized heads, spaceships, hybrid children, and a government intent on hiding them. China is quickly creating its own UFO mythology. But if the accounts are true, their extraterrestrial heritage may go back many centuries, before the communists, before the cultural revolution, and even before the cave art. Back to the isolated mountains, where some believe that a peaceful race called the Dropa crash-landed and created stone disks to preserve their story for posterity. I think for some people, their own paradigm isn't wide enough to accept the idea that they may be looking at possible extraterrestrials. It would cause a revolution in sciences, because this would be the proof that there has been alien people from the stars crash landing here. But the lack of physical evidence sharply divides skeptics and believers. The only evidence we're left with is a series of these Polaroid photographs. So the question is, is this purely a hoax or is there something to it? The, the people involved in the Dropa story, these Chinese scientists and, and other journalists who apparently wrote about it and so forth, are not to be found in any other context at all. No one knows who these people are. There's just no evidence that they actually even existed. First of all, there's no stones. There's no stones with grooves. There's no stones with grooves with hieroglyphics. My attitude is with the Dropa stones. Get a life. Still others stand firm. Well, I myself, I'm convinced there's a truth behind the stone disc story. I'm convinced that most of the 716 stone discs are still in those caves. And maybe by chance it one day happens that another man can step in this area again and find these caves. And this would be a very thrilling thing. If it would be possible to find these stone discs again, it would rise the whole story out of the fox of obscurity again. among the sands and weeds of the Mexican desert. There were rumors since long ago that an object crashed in Mexico. In 1974, a mysterious incident took place that some say involved a UFO and a small plane on a collision course, followed by a race between two governments to recover the debris. The Mexican recovery team finds a sort of a silver-shaped plastic disc. The Mexican military recovered an object and had it on a truck, and something killed all the men. The U.S. government responded very quickly and very organized. They've done this before. But what happened in the Mexican desert is just the beginning of that country's UFO history. The eclipse from July 11, 1991, it practically branded the modern era of UFOs in Mexico. Over the last several decades, it has become a hotbed for UFO encounters. When they picked up the object on radar, the first thing they did was start looking at it. And everyone from pilots to politicians have been witness to sightings. Would you say to the governor that he didn't see something strange in the sky? 
In the next hour, eyewitness interviews, never before seen footage, and expert analysis try to solve the mystery of what really happened that day in the Mexican desert in 1974, and the rash of documented sightings ever since. Coyame, Mexico, a small town not found on many maps, a place swallowed up by the Mexican desert, home to more agave plants than people. Coyame is situated in the northern part of the estate of Chihuahua, and our municipality is 7,000 square feet. We have between 2,000 and 2,500 people. It's a calm place, a beautiful place. A place with no library, no archives and no local historian. But that doesn't mean it's a town without a history. Here, history is passed from neighbor to neighbor. And it's this oral history that gives testimony to an unsolved air collision that took place here just three decades ago. It began as a civilian plane took off from El Paso, Texas, en route to Mexico City. August. 25th, 1974. There was a plane that was coming out from El Paso. It was going to Mexico City, and it was an accident. They say that there was a crash between a plane and a UFO within the territories of the municipality. I don't think this could be made up. How could someone make this up? It's true. August 25th, 1974, 10.07 p.m. It's a quiet summer's night in Koyame. The town's inhabitants are beginning to turn in. 500 miles away, United States air defense systems suddenly register an unknown flying object over the Gulf of Mexico. Streaking across the sky at over 2,500 miles per hour, at an altitude of 75,000 feet, only one thing is for certain. This is not something man-made. Initial indications are that it's probably nothing more than a meteor. But 60 seconds later, it becomes clear that this is no meteor. This object was traveling and descending through steps, unlike that of a meteor again, or more of an arc. The object appears headed on a course towards Corpus Christi, Texas. American air defense systems are alerted. 10.09 p.m. The unidentified flying object now suddenly veers left and enters Mexican airspace just 40 miles south of Brownsville, Texas. The U.S. continues tracking the puzzling spacecraft as it now races over Mexico. Yet what isn't seen on radar is a small craft headed on a trajectory towards the UFO. What's also interesting about this case is about the same time as this UFO was zigging and zagging, there was a plane that was leaving El Paso headed towards Mexico City. Under the cover of night, the small civilian plane from El Paso heads towards Mexico's capital city. But the plane from Texas never reaches its destination. At the same time, the American military watches as their unidentified flying object disappears from radar. It appears that the unthinkable has happened. A UFO plane collision. There's an assumption that there was a collision of some type where uh, both the craft and the plane had collided. August 26th, 1974, 8 a.m. Nine hours after a civilian plane disappeared over the desert, a Mexican recovery team hunts for the downed craft. Across the border, American intelligence is listening in. At 10.35 a.m., the Americans intercept the Mexican military radio report. The wreckage of the missing plane has been spotted just outside Coyame. Moments later, another report shockingly announces the sighting of a second wreck, but this is no plane. The Mexican recovery team finds a sort of a silver-shaped classic disc, some 16 feet 5 inches, about 5 feet thick, convex on both sides, sort of like a saucer. 
The saucer's surface has the appearance of polished steel. It has no markings, no lights, and there are no bodies inside. However, it does appear to be damaged in two spots, possibly caused by a collision with the civilian plane and then falling to the ground. Immediately, Mexican officials declare a radio silence on all search activities. Meanwhile, U.S. officials reach out to the Mexican government, offering assistance in the recovery. Their offer is met with a denial. The Mexican government denied it. They said, no, all we have is just a plane wreckage. While the Mexican team collects the crash debris, the United States is busy assembling their own elite recovery force at Fort Bliss, Texas. The team includes four helicopters, three small Hueys, and a large sea stallion. Prepped and ready to move out, the team is placed on standby while U.S. surveillance scopes out the situation. The U.S. was keeping tabs again through its uh, spy, well, what I call the spy surveillance network, um, through their satellite uh, surveillance as well as uh, airplanes that were flying over at low altitude. American surveillance reveals that the Mexicans have placed the UFO on a flatbed truck and moved out from the crash site. They were able to see there were a number of dead bodies, so which led them to believe that something very extraordinary had happened. August 27th, 2.38 p.m. Unsure of what's happened, U.S. officials greenlight their rescue team. Four helicopters with team members aboard depart Fort Bliss. One of the things that seems obvious in this case is that, that the government, the U.S. government, responded very expertly, very quickly, and very organized. They had this team that assembled in Fort Bliss, and in no time were down there on site recovering this. They've done this before. But nothing will prepare the Americans for what they are about to find. Dressed in bioprotection suits, the American soldiers approach the silent convoy and find all the Mexicans dead. There is no time to investigate what killed the Mexican team, but ufologists have their theories. They somehow came in contact with a, uh, a lethal agent, a bacteriological agent that was um, from out of this world or an extraterrestrial biological agent of some sort that killed them, uh, which is my favorite theory. The US recovery team quickly tends to business it finds the 16-foot-wide silver UFO strapped to the back of a flatbed truck. The straps are reconfigured and connected to a cargo cable from the Sea Stallion helicopter. Safely secure, the estimated 1,500-pound disc is lifted up and headed back to the U.S. With the saucer gone, the team immediately turns their attention to the remaining evidence, the plane wreckage. Vehicles from the convoy and the Mexican team bodies are gathered. They gathered the debris, the bodies from the Mexican recovery team, and then they exploded them with high explosives. The reason why is to hide the evidence. Their work done, the recovery team heads back to base. Where the UFO was taken is unknown. Some have speculated Atlanta, Fort Bliss, or Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. It is an unprecedented event, and I think it's comparable to what happened in Roswell, New Mexico. If this 1974 UFO crash was real, there was no evidence to prove it. Only the passing down of the story from generation to generation kept the tale alive, but few took it seriously. That changed in 1991. That year, not one, not two, but dozens of UFO sightings are reported over Mexico. What gives the 1991 sightings credibility is that strangers reported seeing the same thing at the same time on the same day, and yet they were hundreds of miles apart from each other. For over three decades, the Mexican desert is alleged to have been the site of an incredible tale. There were rumors 
since long ago that an object crashed in Mexico. An object entered our atmosphere through the United States, and it crashed with a small plane. For the last two decades, Mexico has witnessed UFO incidents that rival anything reported in the United States. Mexicans just needed one uniting event to keep their eyes focused to the sky. That happened in 1991. In July of that year, one of the longest solar eclipses in history is set to happen. The total eclipse is visible only in a narrow corridor that includes central Mexico. A year in advance, all the Mexican people knew about the eclipse in 91. I mean, it was an event, it was a moment. All around Mexico, there were people waiting for the eclipse. It was an important eclipse, because even though there have been other eclipses that had taken place until that day, they were not on the magnitude of that eclipse. Just after 1 p.m., the skies above Mexico darken. Astronomers adjust their telescopes. Millions gaze skyward. During 1991, consumer technology makes videos commonplace. On this day, many Mexicans use their cameras to capture the moon as it begins to pass in front of the sun. To their disbelief, they also capture something unexpected. It was a curious thing. During the eclipse, I heard some people who were around us saying, look, what is that there also? Several people filmed and saw metallic objects that are clearly distinguished with the form of a cupola on what is commonly called a flying object. In Mexico City, in Tepeji del Rio, in Puebla, in Cerro de la Estrella. From all corners of Mexico come videos showing a strange metallic looking object just below the eclipse. The eclipse UFOs, or OVNIs as they are called in Mexico, become the talk of the country. But while some are quick to claim that Mexico experienced a UFO encounter, Skeptics aren't buying it. This was one of the great events of the century uh, as far as eclipses and, and astronomical events. And hundreds and thousands of, of astronomers, professional and advanced amateur astronomers, came from all over the world and it converged upon Mexico City and the other towns where the eclipse was visible. Not a single professional astronomer reported seeing anything that wasn't supposed to be there. Professional astronomers immediately doubt any UFO claims and instead offer a more scholarly response. When the sun is totally eclipsed, like it was in Mexico on that day, um, the bright stars and planets become visible for a few minutes. And Venus was very brilliant, and so it was very easy to see when people looked up. And I'm sure that many of the people thought that they saw a UFO. Skeptics have their answer, but UFO believers have their doubts. Because of that, because so many people recorded in different cities these objects, some suggested that had to be the star Venus. But Venus was in a different position than the UFOs were in the tapes. It was something strange that happened during the eclipse. It's afterwards when you start analyzing and looking at the videos that you can start to see in some of them that there are movements that maybe wouldn't correspond to a planet. When you start analyzing more calmly after the fact, that's when you start to wonder if it could have been a UFO. The 1991 sightings ignite a UFO explosion in Mexico. The effect of the UFOs from the 1991 eclipse was like a snowball. And this allowed people with an interest in UFOs to record sightings more frequently. While Mexico's UFO explosion comes as a surprise to most, some ufologists believe it was actually predicted over a thousand years ago. The Maya were one of the great civilizations in history. For over 600 years, they built cities, constructed reservoirs and temple pyramids, and developed an incredible understanding of astronomy. 
Es increíble la sabiduría. It is incredible the knowledge that the Maya had about the sky and the planets. They had a great capacity of observation. They knew the celestial movement and were able to determine every single important event that was going to be registered in the sky. The Maya recorded their information on foldable books called codices. Most of these texts were burned by Spanish priests during the 1500s. Today, just four Mayan codices remain. Among them is the Dresden Codex, a document that offers an enigmatic glimpse into the Mayans' astral wisdom. It's pure astronomical, the moon, the sun, the systems, everything, everything is there. Anybody who has a study and analyzed that consider this document a real treasure from the past. Among the information contained in this codex is an eclipse prediction cycle. The eclipse of 1991 appears in the Dresden Codex. But did the Dresden Codex predict something more? In it, they talk about the meeting with the Brothers of the Stars, which in our language we call extraterrestrials. When I read this, after receiving all these videos, that struck me, that really affected me, because it's like if the Mayans knew long in advance that these sightings were going to take place that day, how can you explain that? Is that a coincidence or they knew? I think they knew. Over a century later, most Mexicans knew something out of the ordinary was happening. Their UFO wave had turned into a tsunami. Literally overnight, Mexicans are mesmerized by the apparent UFO wave striking their country. Ufologists point to the open-mindedness of the Mexican people as being partly responsible for this UFO explosion. Mexicans have been fascinated by legends, stories, elves, fairies. That psychology and sociology allows Mexicans to keep an open mind when it comes to extraordinary occurrences. When you open yourself up to other possibilities, it is much easier to accept the UFO phenomena. However, skeptics claim that Mexico's UFO wave is more of a social phenomenon than any actual increase in visits from little green men. Sightings always seem to come in waves, and these waves are generally, they correlate with the publicity, that if the newspapers or TV stations, whatever, are filled with stories about UFO sightings, people will go out and pay much more attention to things that they see. Since the earliest UFO sightings, witnesses have always been subject to heavy ridicule. They are portrayed as overzealous sky watchers who wouldn't know a DC-9 from a weather balloon. But what happens when the witness is someone who doesn't fit into these categories? What if the person has a solid reputation and career? What if the witness doesn't just know a DC-9, but flies one? Captain Raimundo Cervantes has been flying for over 40 years, with 17,000 hours of flight time, he has seen it all, or at least he thought so. July 28, 1994, Captain Cervantes is piloting Aeromexico Flight 129 from Guadalajara to Mexico City. He's taken the route before and everything seems in order, including the weather. Totally clear, like we the aviators say. We could see the next day, totally clear. As the flight nears Mexico City International Airport, Cervantes puts the DC-9 on course for landing. 5,000 feet in the air, he receives the all clear from the control tower and prepares to lower the landing gear. I order to lower the front wheel. At that moment, we felt an impact on the plane. Very strong. The plane is rocked. To Cervantes, it appears obvious that they have collided with something in midair, but there is no time to investigate. The pilot has already begun his descent of the DC-9. At that moment, I declare an emergency, and I requested an area so that I can develop the list of emergency and coordinate my personnel of flight attendants because I thought we were going to have an abnormal landing. 
Unsure of the condition of the damage to his landing gear, Cervantes needs nerves of steel to coax the wounded jet to safety. We level the plane. We tried to land softly and steady the front wheel. I was concerned that there was damage. We lower the front wheel, and to our surprise, the plane starts rolling perfectly. Disaster is averted. Captain Cervantes wonders if a helicopter has clipped his DC-9 on approach. But the air tower's radar records discredit that theory. Yet an inspection of the DC-9 reveals damage and creates more questions than answers. There was a flight inspector that searched the plane who detected that one of the hydraulic lines was cut. It was cut like if it was done with a cutter. Something very strange. What caused the landing gear's hydraulic line to be cut? A subsequent investigation will place blame for the incident on worn out parts, and the airline denies any mid-air collision. But Captain Cervantes stands by his claim that the plane hit something. That isn't the end of the story. Flight 129's strange encounter is about to get even stranger. Enrique Kolbeck is an air traffic controller who was in the tower that night. Upon learning of Flight 129's incident, he instantly flashes back to a series of phone calls the tower had received earlier that evening. An hour before that flight was initiated in Guadalajara, we received phone calls from different sources. They were communicating to us that an object was flying very close to a building that is almost in the final trajectory to these runways. The sightings place the unidentified flying object right in the landing path of Flight 129. To most, the idea of a plane UFO collision seems unrealistic. But a few days later, another incident at the same airport raises suspicions that something out of the ordinary is going on. August 8, 1994. Co-pilot Carlos Corzo is helping Aeromexico Flight 304 from Acapulco begin its descent into Mexico City International Airport. The morning skies are partly cloudy as co-pilot Corzo looks out the cockpit window. The pilot's eyes are glued to the instruments. He was flying by instruments, so all his view was on the instruments, like was taking care of the surroundings and seeing outside, and even take the communications and helping him with the approach. As the plane breaks through a cloud, a shocked Corzo finds something unexpected. I was leaving 12,000 feet and came out of the, of the cloud, and I see this big object in front of us, and I really get scared. I thought we was going to have a collision, and I tell my captain in a surprise expression that, oh my God, we're gonna crash. The mysterious craft streaks by the front of Flight 304, barely missing the plane's nose. It was a huge object, maybe 15 or 20 meters radio, something like uh, platinum or some kind of very neat metal. Corzo quickly regains his composure and helps land the plane without further incident. Afterward, he speaks to an air traffic controller who reveals that Corzo's plane was in fact the fifth plane that week to report seeing an unidentified object. I can tell you about approximately 99% of pilots that I have talked to believe that we are not alone here. And the evidence that we have had confirms it. We take it very seriously because it could affect our airspace. Definitely, there is a potential danger because we do not know what produces the phenomenon and what it is made of and why it is manifested. Nearly a decade later, another incident in the Mexican skies would send shockwaves worldwide. Yet, unlike previous encounters, this one would have everyone believing, including the Mexican government. 
Every year on the night of September 15th, they come together. Thousands pack the main square in Mexico City to watch their president ring the very same bell that signaled the start of their fight for independence almost two centuries ago. The next 24 hours will be full of parades, parties, and celebrations. But in the early 1990s, a new Mexican Independence Day tradition is born. September 16 is Mexican independence, and we have a military parade on the streets of Mexico. For several years, we used to have an air show. The whole Mexican Air Force used to go out and fly over Mexico City. A lot of people would film these events when the planes would pass over the houses. There are many videos where certain objects are seen, flying over and passing closely. September 16th, 1991. During a flyover, an amateur videographer captures a mysterious bright round object. September 16th, 1992. An unidentified object is spotted flying through the sky. September 16th, 1993. As a squadron of helicopters conducts maneuvers, a metallic looking object appears to weave through their formation. Three years, three sightings. Yet the Mexican military offers no comment on the encounters. With respect to the sightings of these objects during military parades, the government never voiced an opinion for or against. The government here has always remained aloof. This comes as no surprise to the UFO community, who for decades has claimed that governments are actively suppressing UFO encounters. Blacked out reports, secret projects, and constant denials have all fed the notion of a massive cover-up. March 5th, 2004. Mexico's 501 Air Squadron is on a routine search for drug smuggling aircraft. But the military pilots witness something far from routine. The Air Force in Mexico patrols the south border to stop airplanes with narcotics from South America. They regularly, they do this many times every day with different airplanes. But this day is different. During an afternoon surveillance run, the team picks something up on their radar. They assume it's a drug running plane and take off after it. Following it on radar, the object appears to be changing speeds erratically, at times traveling at over 380 miles per hour. While in pursuit, the crew turns on their forward-looking infrared system, or FLIR. It's like a camera that uh, is mounted on the aircraft, and its purpose is to look not using visible light like an ordinary camera would, but using infrared. The infrared eyes of the plane's exterior-mounted FLIR system transmits video to the crew inside. This is the actual video as seen by the crew. But as Mexican Air Patrol gets closer to the object, the crew are unable to spot anything using the FLIR or with their own eyes. And all this time that they're flying towards it, they are looking ahead of the aircraft, because that's where it says that this radar target is, ahead of the aircraft, and they're looking, they couldn't see anything. After chasing the object for several minutes, the crew determines they are too low on gas to continue the hunt. They turn around and begin heading back to the base, the unknown object soon vanishes from radar. Yet, their adventure is just beginning. The FLIR operator was still operating the FLIR, and he started picking up uh, bright lights that appeared to be at cloud level. Suddenly, appearing on the FLIR through the clouds isn't just one ball of light, but at times as many as 11 objects appear to be weaving through the clouds. The crew got a little bit spooked over what was going on because they couldn't identify these things. They didn't know what it was they were looking at. This is a veteran crew who have flown this route before and have been using the FLIR system for almost two years. But on this day, even the most experienced of pilots would be unnerved. 
as the cockpit recordings reveal. <laughs> it appears to the crew the objects aren't just traveling alongside their plane, but surrounding it. <laughs> then suddenly, the balls of light disappear, leaving the scared and confused crew to return to base. Over the next several weeks, the Mexican military conducts an investigation into the incident. Crew members are interviewed, images analyzed, and weather data evaluated, yet no answers are found. It appears this case is destined to go unsolved and forgotten. Then one phone call changes everything and makes UFO history. They called me and said, we have something that is from common interest. Mexican TV journalist Jaime Masson is an expert on investigating Mexican UFO claims. Masson's impressive resume attracts the Mexican government, who asked the civilian reporter to assist. In an unprecedented move, Mexico's Secretary of Defense hands over to Masson the classified FLIR UFO video. He gave me the video and said, please be fair with the military, please be fair with these pilots, uh, do your investigation, you are authorized officially to do your investigation to present this in the media. Mausan is given complete access to flight records, weather reports, and most importantly, the crew members. I am interviewing these pilots inside the Secretary of Defense. This is first in history in Mexico. They told me what they saw. They were very honest and sincere. No, we never had the opportunity to identify them visually. I never saw this kind of object before. Something that we never saw before, it never happened to us before. So yes, we had fear. On May 11th, Mausan holds a press conference to present the tape to the world. It doesn't take long for skeptics to denounce any UFO theory. Their explanations come fast and furious. It's ball lightning. You'd have a whole fleet of these top secret aircraft flying. Some skeptics and UFO investigators suggested that the equipment was not working well. One after another, explanations are given, and one after another, they are discredited. However, a new theory emerges that might solve the mystery. There's a theory that what the officials filmed out there were the flames of the oil wells that are 100 to 120 kilometers from the account. They appeared to be brilliant glowing objects in the infrared. Of course, they were not visible to the eye, but that's the whole purpose of the infrared camera system is so that you can see things by their heat signature, you can see things that are not visible to the eye. Could what was showing up on the FLIR system actually be distant oil wells? Those who've examined the case have their doubts. First thing that we did was analyze the lights to determine their shape, to see if there was shape to them, and how did it change frame to frame, minute to minute. If the lights are oil wells, as skeptics have claimed, then they should flicker like a flame. But using computer programs to break down the lights reveals something very different. Over a period of frames and minutes, the glow may change on the outer edges, but there is an object in the center that is rock steady. It's a ball, it's a sphere, and it's not possible that it's a flame because if it was a flame it would be undulating not just from the edges out but over the entire object adding to the case against the oil well theory is the fact that despite flights in this area daily no one has ever reported this kind of encounter before the only way really really to prove this would be to do it under the same basis, using a FLIR camera 
flying the same route, probably with the same airplane. Until that happens, the Mexican Air Force encounter remains an unsolved mystery. But for UFO researchers, that doesn't take away from the importance of this landmark case. For the first time, a government turned to the UFO community for help. Mexican UFO investigators are optimistic that this incident may signal a new era of openness by governments. This is going to produce many, many new cases and more openness in the future. There are many other people who are now trying to become investigators in Mexico. This is just the beginning. It was just the beginning. In 2005, just when it appeared things couldn't get any stranger in Mexico, they did. Since 1991, Mexican witnesses have videotaped hundreds of hours of footage containing alleged unidentified flying objects. But while the sheer volume of sightings has impressed some, it's what's on these tapes that matters. But out of the thousands of thousands of videos that we have, most of the times are, yeah, balloons, airplanes, stars, mistakes, honest mistakes. Probably just 10 or 15% of them are good, really good. It's this 10% that has drawn the attention of everyone from ufologists to the mainstream media. Among the most interesting UFO phenomenons captured on tape are what is referred to as fleets. A group of more than three objects we call fleets. They travel horizontally or vertically with very strange forms as boomerangs, spheres, disks. June 10th, 2004, Guadalajara, Mexico. An amateur photographer captures unknown objects in the sky. June 21st, 2004, 300 miles away in Cuernavaca, Mexico, another fleet is caught on tape. March 30th, 2005, almost 600 miles north in Torreón, yet more unexplainable objects dot the Mexican sky. April 11th, 2005, 500 miles to the south in Mexico City, the skies over the capital city are full of mysterious aircraft. I believe it's a way that someone is using to communicate with us. I believe they are trying to, to say something similar to what happened in England with the crop formations. Skeptics are quick to dismiss fleets as nothing more than weather balloons or birds. But seeing is believing. And in June 2005, a fleet sighting had people believing. One of the more recent accounts of UFO sightings here in Mexico happened here in Jalapa, Veracruz. And it is very interesting because the witnesses were of a very high caliber. June 24th, 2005. 10.30 a.m. A public ceremony is being held to celebrate the delivery of new patrol cars to the local police department. On hand are such dignitaries as Governor Fidel Herrera Beltran, high-ranking police department officials, and the local media. Moments after Governor Beltran finishes his speech, cries of UFO, UFO echo through the crowd. Instantly, all eyes are on the mysterious objects hovering above. We have as a first-hand witness the governor of Jalapa, and the newspapers published the news the next day, and it was spread throughout Mexico. Days later, a local newspaper reports that the alleged UFOs were actually balloons released by local school children. But this explanation only raises more questions for UFO believers. If they were balloons, why did they appear frozen in formation for over half an hour? As the witness says, it was more than 14 sphere objects that were shining in the sky, formed a triangle formation and remained there for 30 minutes. I just find it hard to believe that balloons could stay in the same place and in the same formation for half an hour. I think this is an extraordinary observation because it's a governor. 
and all of his advisors and police personnel who observed this case. Would you say to the governor that he didn't see something strange in the sky? It's those strange things in the sky that have brought together these UFO experts and enthusiasts. From all parts of Mexico, they have come to discuss the UFO wave that their country has undergone. For these men and women, the encounters that have taken place deserve attention and answers. Among the incidents they examined is the alleged 1974 UFO plane collision near Coyame, Mexico. The word is getting around somehow that something happened and that the U.S. was interested in this crash. The information that Gilberto has is very little, but the data that makes this case lends itself to the possibility that this may have been real. Three decades later, Koyame still has more questions than answers. But are there clues out there that could break the case wide open? Any motivated investigative journalism student of today or professional would have a field day, go to the town, track down all the people in the town that used to be there and live there by, uh, by address and, and find them and interview them. It requires more rigorous study. Um, it requires more of a collaborative effort, hopefully among the research, UFO research communities between the United States and Mexico. So it's a case that's gonna need more further investigation. And like any seminal event in history, there is a last second plot twist. I was recently in uh, Chihuahua and I asked about this case and there is a rumor that there are photographs around this case that I haven't seen. I was promised that I was going to receive these photographs, but people there, there are still afraid. It seems that they have kept these photographs for a long, long time. Fittingly, once again, the Koyame story is shrouded in mystery. Did a UFO crash in the Mexican desert in August of 1974? Did a Mexican recovery team fall prey to an unknown biological poison? The truth may never be known. But what we do know is that over the last 15 years, Mexico has experienced something out of the ordinary. For UFO believers, this appears to be a golden age of alien encounters. Only one thing is certain. Mexico, a land steeped in history, is now steeped in mystery. For more than 20 years, a handful of U.S. Air Force personnel had been haunted by an event that took place in the Rendlesham Forest, just outside their base in Suffolk, England. They maintain that for two nights in 1980, they experienced, up close, an encounter with an unidentified craft. Their accounts make the Rendlesham incident one of the most detailed and well-documented to date. These witnesses also say that the government launched an investigation and then tried to cover it up. This event has an eerie similarity to a sighting nearly 33 years earlier when an extraterrestrial spacecraft allegedly crashed near a military base in Roswell, New Mexico. Both stories involve eyewitness accounts from respected officers, government investigations, and classified records and evidence. This really was the holy grail. This was certainly Britain's most famous UFO case. There's no doubt about it. This is Britain's Roswell. It, it appears to be maybe moving a little bit this way. It's coming this way. It is definitely coming this way. This is unreal. What really happened in the woods outside the Woodbridge Bentwaters Air Base in December 1980? If you contact the Pentagon about what happened December 1980 at RAF Woodbridge, England, they're gonna tell you right now nothing happened there. People need to step up to the plate and say something. It happened and it was real and someone else visited Rendlesham Forest in 1980.
This is Bentwaters Royal Air Force Base. Located 70 miles northeast of London, the now dormant site was once a highly sophisticated military installation. The main function of the twin bases there was to uh, support the NATO effort on, in case of a, a war in Europe. We would go ahead and uh, mobilize our A-10 aircraft to uh, support uh, whatever war effort we were told to do. In 1980, with Cold War tensions near their peak, Bentwaters and nearby Woodbridge air bases are operated by about 12,000 U.S. Air Force personnel, making it one of the largest NATO complexes in all of Europe. But the site, bordered by the dense Rendlesham Forest, has a secret. This was Bentwaters' weapons storage area. Exactly what was kept here is officially classified. But researchers and observers agree that a massive nuclear arsenal was stockpiled beneath these concrete bunkers. The extraordinarily secured underground bunkers with alternating layers of steel, concrete, earth, steel, concrete, earth, held something like 300,000 kilotons of nuclear ordnance. The American airmen who man this base are highly skilled. They're trained to deal with life and death situations with a cool, clear head. And that makes the events at Rendlesham even more mysterious, because what they saw on Christmas night, 1980, made these thick-skinned military men shudder with fear. It's 3 a.m. Airman John Burroughs is patrolling the east gate of Woodbridge Air Base, part of his normal routine as a security policeman. Security did the airfields, weapon storage areas, and stuff like that. You control the entry of the base. The 20-year-old has been with the Air Force for almost two years and has been stationed at Bentwaters for about a year and a half. Tonight, there is nothing to observe but the stars overhead. It was cold that night. It was a clear night, pretty much. You know, it was a clear night. There's a little bit of fog. As he's walking, his superior, Bud Stevens, pulls up in a truck. He tracked me down and said, let's ride around for a while. The men drive into Rendlesham Forest. Suddenly, Sergeant Stevens notices a strange light in the woods just off the road. He said, whoa, is that normal? And I looked out, and there was just a weird glow in the woods. I said, no, it's not normal. Burroughs can't shake a bad feeling. You know, you just felt a real sense of danger or something wasn't right. There were different colored lights. You know, like you see on a Christmas display, different colored lights that were blinking on and off. Alarmed. The men speed back to the gate to call the flight desk from a secure phone line. They do not want to broadcast the information over their radios. At Burroughs' insistence, the call is transferred to the base's Central Security Control, or CSC. The shift commander dispatches 26-year-old Sergeant Jim Penniston to the site. Penniston has been a security policeman with the Air Force for seven years. They told me I need to go out the east gate. We have a situation out there. And I said, what type of situation? He said, well, I'd rather have the on-scene patrolman tell you what that is. And I says, well, can it wait? No, you got to get out immediately. Within minutes, Penniston and his driver arrive at the east gate. Burroughs and Stevens direct his attention to the woods. I seen this multicolor uh, yellow and red. It was about, you know, two, three hundred meters away. And it looked like an aircraft crash immediately. That's the color that you get from uh, titanium and fuel burning. Penniston calls back to CSC and gets clearance to investigate a possible downed aircraft. If it is an aircraft crash, we can go ahead and, uh, you know, render assistance and uh, set up security for it. As part of standard procedure, Sergeant Penniston tries to gather information from Bud Stevens. And I said, well, do you hear it crash, bud? He said, no, it didn't crash. It landed. Stevens is too frightened to help with the investigation. He returns to his post, while Burroughs and Penniston proceed without him. Soon after, they speed off with a driver and head toward the mysterious light. When they can no longer maneuver the vehicle around the dense trees, Burroughs and Penniston proceed on foot. 
They walk about 50 meters and notice strong interference on their radios. The farther we got into the woods, the, it became more and more inter, intermediate, where it was harder and harder to talk to them. Suddenly, Sergeant Penniston feels an electrical charge in the air. I've been in excitable situations before uh, on duty, and um, I know the adrenaline feeling, but this here was different. You could feel it on your clothes, your face, your hair. The closer they move toward the light, the less the scene resembles a crash. Didn't have no smell of smoke, and uh, it was too contained. It was just like one ball out there. And we came into a clearing, and then that's when it was like a bright light lit up. The whole area it was almost blinding. Sergeant Penniston moves within 10 feet of the object, and the bright light dims. As his eyes adjust, he has trouble understanding what he's seeing. I'm a rational person. I wanted a rational explanation of what was going on. I could not come up with one. Penniston snaps pictures with his military-issued camera. The craft was triangular in shape uh, and measured uh, probably nine feet wide by about eight feet high. I couldn't tell the front or back to it. I mean, there was no uh, engines on one side or no cockpit or nothing like that. It was all completely smooth, the outside of the craft. He then circles the object, writing descriptions in a notepad. These are the notes he wrote that night. Surface is unknown. Identity unknown. No apparent landing gear present. No sound, but appears to be operating somehow. Peniston's handwriting changes dramatically as he gets closer to the craft. I, I was really having problems with the, the type of craft. I keep, I keep saying it's unknown. I, I have a problem with understanding what I'm, what I'm, what I'm recording here. When he draws near enough, he reaches out and touches the object. The fabric of the craft was smooth, like glass. It was uh, warm to the touch, but not hot. There was like lights on it. it was, somehow it was in the fabric of the craft. On the front side of the object, Penniston notices several strange symbols. He copies them in his notebook as well. They were like markings, uh, not uh, numbers, not language. There were several, maybe six symbols uh, measuring three feet wide. I wasn't trained for uh, what I was experiencing. Suddenly, the object emits a blinding flash of light. The men take cover. Then the object, whatever it was, lifted up, went up, and then moved back away over the trees. The speed of the craft leaving the area was uh, I best, the best way to describe it is probably uh, in a blink of an eye. I've never seen any craft move that fast in my uh, entire Air Force career, and uh, I don't think I ever will again. As the men slowly rise to their feet, their attention is drawn by another flash of light through the trees. At first, they assume it is the craft, but on second glance, they realize it is the Orford Nest Lighthouse five miles away. Burroughs and Penniston check their radios. They're working again. It is now around 5 a.m., roughly two hours since they first spotted the mysterious lights in the woods. They contact the CSC, and their commander orders them to rendezvous with a security team back at the East Gate. So we were like, what are we gonna say? What, you know, what, we can't explain what we saw, we can't explain what just happened. Later that morning, the men are brought in for debriefing. Penniston is reluctant to divulge everything he witnessed. It was not a good career move to report exactly what we seen. I went into the shift commander's office with uh, Burroughs and uh, we uh, gave a sanitized briefing of, of what happened that night. After the debriefing, Penniston says the shift commander issues him a thinly veiled warning. Gentlemen, he says, uh, Project Blue Book ended in 1969, and sometimes things are best left alone. 
Project Blue Book was the code name for the U.S. Air Force's controversial UFO investigation unit. During the course of our investigation... Before it was disbanded, its goal was to determine if UFOs were a potential threat to national security. Despite his commander's warning, Sergeant Penniston can't put the strange encounter out of his mind. I got back to my house and I couldn't go to sleep. I'd probably uh, sat around the house for maybe two or three hours. And finally I said, well, I, I gotta go back out there. He returns to the site with some plaster of Paris. His plan, to make casts of any indentations left by the craft. I wasn't gonna leave there until I had answers. I wanted something tangible. He spots three round impressions in a symmetrical pattern on the ground. They are a few inches deep and roughly 10 feet apart. They measured exactly the same distance apart, each of the pods, approximately two to three inches thick. These are the casts made by Penniston the morning after his sighting. He believes they show the marks left by the craft when it landed on the forest floor. He decides not to show them to his superiors. Along with his notes and roll of film, the sergeant now has the three plaster molds to help back up his story. But Penniston's physical evidence doesn't solve the mystery of Rendlesham. Just two nights later, the UFO returns. And this time, the deputy base commander makes a chilling record of his own encounter. Now we're observing what appears to be a beam coming down to the ground. This is unreal. Late December, 1980. Sightings of a mysterious craft at the Woodbridge Bentwaters NATO complex in Suffolk, England, have put many airmen on edge. The strange encounters began the night of the 25th, when airmen reported seeing unusual lights. By the early morning hours of the 26th, two men claimed to have come within a few feet of a landed craft in the neighboring forest. It's now the evening of the 27th. 40-year-old Deputy Base Commander, Lieutenant Colonel Charles Halt, attends a holiday party at the Officers Club. His celebration is cut short when one of his men arrives looking distressed. He showed up just white as a sheet. And he wasn't the type of uh, person to get too excited too easily. He was a former Marine. He said, it's back. We looked at each other and said, what's back? He said, the UFO. After two nights of disturbing stories, Holt decides to investigate for himself. The police were spending more time looking in the sky than they were at the airplanes they were supposed to be protecting. It's time to put this to rest. Holt instructs a three-man security team to assemble their gear and meet him at his quarters. Within minutes, they head toward the Rendlesham Forest. By the time Holt arrives, a security cordon has been established around the perimeter of the woods. Halt is briefed on the situation and is told that the UFO is no longer visible. But the men are experiencing mysterious outages in their high-powered floodlights called light halls. Halt and his team collect their gear, a still camera, a Geiger counter for measuring radiation, and a night vision device called a starscope. I took my small personal cassette recorder, which I carry just about everywhere with me just to record the events. The team heads into the dark woods. And I was going to investigate and show that there was definitely a good, a good reasonable explanation for everything. The following is the recording Halt made that night. 150 feet or more from the initial, I should say, suspected impact point. Having a little difficulty, we can't get the light all the work. There seems to be some kind of mechanical problem. Along with the malfunctioning light halls, Holt's team encounters the same radio interference experienced by Burroughs and Penniston two nights prior. They are walking through the area where Burroughs and Penniston reported seeing the unidentified craft, when Holt notices gashes in the bark of several trees. It looks as if they have been struck by a large object. Holt orders one of his men to take photographs. He took pictures of the indentations of the trees and everything. He was taking snap, snap, snap all the time. The Geiger counter begins registering high levels of radiation, but only in the areas surrounding the alleged landing site. You're getting readings on 
the tree you're taking samples from on the side facing the suspected landing site. Four clicks, Max. Up to four. Interesting. That's right where you're taking the sample now. Four. That's the strongest point on the tree? Yes, sir. If you come to the back, there's no clicks whatsoever. Suddenly, the dark woods are alive with sound. We're hearing very strange sounds out of the farmers burning our animals. They very, very active, making an awful lot of noise. All the animals in the forest were acting up, making a lot of noise. And the barnyard animals from the farm, which was on the adjacent side of the particular location, were also acting up. One of his men points out a glowing light in the distance. With his tape recorder rolling, Halt documents every moment of this encounter. You just saw a light yes, where? Where? Right on this position here, straight ahead in between the tree. There it is again. Watch. Straight ahead off my flash right there. Yeah, there, there it is. Hey, I see it too. What is it? We don't know, sir. Sir, what is it? We saw this bright red glowing object. It looked like an eye. It's the best way I can describe it. It was bright red, had a dark center, and appeared like as though it were winking. We're about 150 or 200 yards from the site. Everything else is just deathly calm. There is no doubt about it. There's some type of strange flashing red light ahead. It's yellow. I saw a yellow tinge in it, too. Weird. It, it, it appears that you may be moving a little bit this way. Yes, it's brighter than it has been. Yellow. It's coming this way. It is definitely coming this way. It was moving through the trees horizontally, but also traveling vertically. In other words, it was zigzagging through the trees and dripping what appeared to be, the best way I can describe it, as molten metal. Halt and his men pursue the object into a nearby field. As we approached, it receded. It went away from us. It went out into the farmer's field. It stayed there for probably 20, 30 seconds, maybe a little more. Pieces of it are shooting off. There is no doubt about it. This is weird. And then it silently exploded and broke into multiple white objects. So we went into the field and searched around on the ground looking for burnt marks or evidence of whatever was coming off the object. The men find nothing in the field. Overhead, the object makes a sudden turn. It approached us at very, very high speed. Oh, here, here, here he comes from the south. He's coming toward us now. Sure. It stopped overhead and sent down a beam. The best way I can describe it is like a laser beam. Now we're observing what appears to be a beam coming down to the ground. This is unreal. It was a steady, constant beam as far as the diameter. It fell at our feet, and we all just were in awe. And I thought, was it trying to signal? Is it trying to warn us? Is it threatening us? And just as suddenly as it appeared, the light went click and was off. The object speeds away. The team watches, mesmerized, as it moves over the base and continues to beam lights to the ground. To some, it appears that the light is beaming directly into the base's weapon storage area, where nuclear missiles are reportedly housed. There's one object still hovering over Woodbridge Base at about 5 to 10 degrees off the horizon, still moving erratic and similar lights and beaming down this area. At this point, Holt's recorder runs out of tape. A craft is still hovering in the distance, but Halt and his team aren't sure what to do next. There's no protocol for what they've just encountered. Unnerved and exhausted, the men head back to base. Airman John Burroughs, who had witnessed a UFO two nights earlier, arrives at the site, along with Sergeant Adrian Bustinza. Burroughs is immediately concerned by the behavior of the men returning from the field. They were kind of, I don't know, they were weird. I mean, they were upset. After a brief conversation, Burrow spots a blue light glowing in the same clearing Halt has just examined. The airman is determined to investigate further. I was bugging him, come on, Colonel, let me go out and see. I mean, I want to see what it is. So he finally authorized myself and Bastenza to go forward to, to get a closer look. The men head toward the strange blue glow in the field. Adrenaline quickly takes over, and Burroughs breaks into a run. As I was getting close to whatever it was, all of a sudden it was gone. The field is thrown into darkness, leaving the airmen scared and confounded. This was gone, and I'm standing out in the field, and there's nothing. 
Burroughs turns to Bastenza in disbelief. He goes, I, what happened to you? And I go, I don't know what you're talking about. He goes, and you were like involved in the lights. He said, you were just like, it was like all of a sudden you were there and then you were in the lights and you were gone. Burroughs and Bustenza return to base. Burroughs' second encounter with the bizarre lights leaves him with nothing but questions. They are unaware that a sweeping investigation involving covert government agencies is already underway. The men claim that as they headed back to the base that night, they were walking into a government conspiracy. January 1981. Rumors are swirling around the Woodbridge Bentwaters Air Bases in eastern England after mysterious UFOs are sighted by the US Air Force personnel stationed there. Many of them were, were some years into their tour of duty. These were highly trained witnesses. It's not as if they'd all just turned up there the night before. The military investigation that followed remains controversial to this day. Those who say they witnessed the UFOs believe the military was more interested in damage control than in finding the truth. What our government did in the name of secrecy to these individuals is absolutely shameful. According to these airmen, they soon became unwilling participants in a government cover-up. Initially, the investigation follows standard military procedure. Deputy Base Commander Charles Halt, a witness himself, begins debriefing the airmen who reported seeing the craft. I had no choice. I couldn't ignore it. There were so many witnesses and so many people at so many different places. John Burroughs, who witnessed the UFOs on both nights, says his interview is clear cut. He took our statements, kind of looked at them, said it was really a wild thing, and there's really no explanation for what's going on, and that's how it was kind of left. Others, like Sergeant Jim Penniston, say that after their meeting with Halt, a long and disturbing process begins. Two weeks after his initial interview, Penniston is called for another debriefing. This time, it is with a high-ranking team of investigators, the OSI. The OSI is the Office of Special Investigations. It's, uh, how shall I say, the, the discreet police is one way to put it. And they are there to police the US Air Force. And they can actually walk into the, an office of a general and, you know, even arrest him, if you like. That's how powerful they are. When Penniston enters the room, the mood is ominous. He begins to give a statement and offers the investigators sketches and notes of his encounter. According to Penniston, the rest of the interview is a blur. To this day, he has a difficult time recalling precisely what tactics the OSI used to extract his information. They took extra steps to make sure I was telling the truth. Sodium pentothal, I'm sure I gave a release for that. And hope that they understood that everything I said was the truth. I think, I, I believe I gave my permission for that, I would think. To Penniston, the military's investigation takes on a sinister tone as more men are called in for questioning. Shortly after the event, Sergeant Adrian Bustinza, who had accompanied John Burroughs to the field, is led to a room beneath the base for questioning. Even now, Bustinza refuses to speak publicly about the events of that night. According to author Georgina Bruni, he later confided in her. They said to him, look, you know, what you saw was a light from the, the local lighthouse. And he said, no, no, I saw much more than that. It was more than that. No, you don't get the picture, do you? And they would not let him go until he agreed that what he saw was the lighthouse. And the moment they said to him, bullets are cheap, a dime a dozen, is when he said, OK, it was the lighthouse. Other witnesses also say they are told to drop their stories about seeing a UFO. We were told that we couldn't talk about it, was to treat it as top secret, and that was it. We never talked about it. According to Airman Burroughs, the signs of a government cover-up are obvious. 
Shortly after his interrogation, Burroughs is back on guard duty. As he makes his rounds, he can see that the woods are bustling with activity. There was vehicles leaving Woodbridge going out into the forest. There was helicopters flying around out there, so there was some stuff going on out there. Exactly what, I don't know. Deputy Base Commander Charles Holt is also aware of covert activities going on at the base. I heard some stories that were substantiated by several people that uh, a plane load of people did come in a day or so later and did do a lot of investigating. Peniston and Holt claim they took pictures of the mysterious craft they encountered. But when the prints return from the base's photo lab, they are blank. The pictures are whited out, most of them. Uh, I thought that was really uh, unusual. And I believe that the photos that I got were intentionally just whited out photographs. That's what I believe. Even Lieutenant Colonel Holt, the highest ranking eyewitness, believes he is being kept in the dark by the military. As the investigation continues, he's asked to type up a memo based on his interviews with other witnesses and submit it to his superiors. Holt's understanding is that the document will be shared with the British government. Holt does as he is told and submits a memo entitled, Unexplained Lights. He writes, the individuals reported seeing a strange glowing object in the forest. The object was described as being metallic in appearance and triangular in shape. It is not a definitive report. Many of the details are missing or incorrect, and the descriptions at times are vague. The memo was not meant for public consumption. It was meant as a tickler, if you will, to the Ministry of Defense to get them involved to do a proper investigation. His superiors filed the memo away and the strange lights never returned to the base. Eventually, rumors of an extraterrestrial craft die down. For three years, the public is kept in the dark about what happened at the air bases. Then in 1983, a new witness surfaces with a startling claim about the UFO encounter, one that will only deepen the mystery of Rendlesham. October 2nd, 1983. The British Sunday tabloid, News of the World, hits newsstands with the headline, UFO lands in Suffolk, and that's official. The article claims that a mysterious craft moving under intelligent control invaded the skies above the Woodbridge Bentwaters Air Bases in late December 1980. But most intriguing is the offering of a piece of written evidence an official U.S. Air Force memo confirming the alleged sightings. The document was written by one of the men who encountered the mysterious object, Deputy Base Commander Charles Holt. Every local radio, TV station, Japanese TV, German TV, I had people swarming all over the place wanting to know the real story. From there onwards, every single newspaper in the United Kingdom was featuring the story for about a week. The memo titled Unexplained Lights, offers a brief description of the late December encounters. It includes Jim Penniston's description of a strange object that maneuvered through the trees, as well as Holt's account of a red sun-like object in the night sky. But how was the story leaked to the public? The document, known as the Holt Memo, was brought to light by Larry Warren, a former Air Force security policeman at Bentwaters, He's blunt when he explains why he did it. I want to drag people right by their hair through the thing and say, this happened. He was the one, the one, who brought this whole thing to public attention. It was his information specifically that resulted in a Freedom of Information Act that resulted in the release of the so-called HALT document. And once that single sheet of paper was out, the toothpaste was out of the tube. Warren has received both praise and criticism for his candidness. The story he tells begins like the others, but the ending is even more bizarre. In late 1980, Warren was a 19-year-old security policeman stationed at Bentwaters. According to Warren, after midnight on December 29th, he is removed from his post and ordered to the woods to assist with Colonel Halt's investigation. 
When he reaches a clearing, he sees a group of military personnel surrounding a glowing object. In this field was this object on the ground. It's like a science fiction movie, but there was something alive associated with it. It didn't come out any doors. There were no windows. It was this thing, and it was changing all the time. As he draws within a few feet of the craft, Warren says he witnesses an amazing sight. There are officers and airmen facing the object, and three small glowing entities standing in the light. What he observes and the other men observe that are in proximity is three humanoid shapes. There was something separate from it with these uh, three, what you would perceive as kids. Warren then watches as a senior officer begins communicating with the beings. The senior people there seemed to be following like a protocol. It seemed to be there was a procedure. Warren is then pulled from the clearing. He's given no explanation for what he's just seen. The next day, he says he is brought into a room with other witnesses for debriefing. He remembers a film projector and three men in suits. They showed us the different films of UFO military activity going back probably, I don't know, the 40s. Like other witnesses, Warren says the more he is questioned, the more distorted his memories become. He remembers what happens next as a series of scenes that make little sense. Warren recalls being taken against his will by men in dark suits, then being led to an underground facility on the base. I remember being on a table and people talking to me and, you know, doctors and Air Force people behind them. I have another memory of being in a kind of like a mess hall and trying to eat something and kind of being alone at a table. It's imagery. I mean, this could all have been plugged into my head. Warren says he isn't sure if what he remembers is real or if these images were planted by military investigators in order to confuse him and distract him from what really occurred. After the Rendlesham story breaks, Warren's accusations infuriate other witnesses. These airmen and officers say they too want the truth revealed, but that Warren's story is anything but. It hurt the whole incident as far as this is, something really did happen to us, but there's no way the way he was describing it, what happened to us, and it wasn't fair to the people who were involved to have that kind of extreme stuff come out. Parts of his story do correspond with other eyewitness accounts. Warren, like Charles Halt and Jim Penniston, recalls seeing a glowing craft in the clearing of the Rendlesham Woods shortly after Christmas 1980. But Larry Warren is the only airman who claims he saw alien life forms. Another problem with Warren's version of events is that no one can remember seeing him in the woods on the night in question. Nobody ever recalls him being out there that night. Nobody I've ever, I've talked to all the players and just about everybody was on the, uh, even the fringes and nobody remembers seeing Larry Warren anywhere except around the base in training. Warren remains steadfast in his convictions. I've never lost a minute's sleep over my role in this. I've never intentionally misrepresented anything, lied or tried to gain anything uh, unfairly. The contradictions surrounding the Rendlesham case have proven frustrating for UFO researchers. While there are multiple credible witnesses, airmen trained to be good observers and remain calm under extreme circumstances, the discrepancies between their stories are difficult to ignore. In the years that follow, researchers struggle to unravel the mystery. Then, in 2002, Declassified government files reveal new facts about those mysterious nights in the woods. And which could have been the spot where the alien craft landed. Since 1983, the Rendlesham UFO incident has garnered attention around the world. But to this day, there is still no explanation for what US Air Force personnel claim they saw in the woods and skies of Suffolk, England. Some experts who have reviewed the reports of strange lights and a glowing spacecraft have concluded that these sightings are a simple case of optical illusion. Retired Air Force Major and astronomer James McGehee 
learned about the incident by chance. I first heard about the Rindlesham Forest case in 1983 when I was at the base uh, conducting a military exercise there on temporary duty. During his tour, he discovers that five miles from the twin bases, on the shores of the North Sea, sits the Orford Ness Lighthouse. McGehee feels that witnesses mistook this lighthouse for a UFO. If you're out in a dark sky on a cold night in December, and a lighthouse is swinging through the trees with this bright beam of light passing through the trees, it's going to have some strange, unusual effects. Light is going to get scattered by the trees. John Burroughs did mention this lighthouse in his first statement to his superiors. In the report, he says that after the mysterious lights disappeared, he thought the lighthouse was another craft, but quickly realized his mistake. I want to clarify something. I've always, this is always somebody tries to twist it. If you read the statement, especially mine, it clearly distinguishes between what we saw at the beginning and then we did see a beacon light and we followed it. Nowhere in my statement does it say, I felt the beacon light was the object. I've done a whole lot of research on this lighthouse. You know, you can talk about it from here to eternity. And there's absolutely no way that a lighthouse can travel five miles, go in and out of trees, shoot beams down to the ground. So anyway, it's not a lighthouse. But McGehee claims there is a second explanation for the lights in the sky that has nothing to do with UFOs. On the night of the 25th, at around uh, 9.30 in the evening, a Cosmos satellite re-entered the Earth's atmosphere. It would have looked like a fireball, which is a very, very bright meteor. For nearly 20 years, skeptics and believers continue their search for answers. In 2002, thanks in part to researchers like Georgina Bruni, the British government finally releases a new set of records. The files provide additional information about the case, but also raise new questions. They make it clear that the British government investigated the mysterious sightings back in 1981. This fact seems to indicate that military investigators did not believe the sightings were caused by a lighthouse or a satellite. But the files also reveal some of the shortcomings of that investigation. We discovered that some of the radar facilities were actually faulty. The cameras were faulty on the nights in question, or allegedly faulty, that the films were missing. At the time, investigators based their research on the original memo written by Lieutenant Colonel Charles Holt. His document states that the first event occurred on December 27th, but the sightings actually began on the 25th. Holt's mistake has caused researchers to examine the wrong nights for 20 years. It is a frustrating revelation for Nick Pope, an official with the Ministry of Defense. Here we had possibly the most significant UFO event ever to have taken place on British soil. And yet, not only were the dates wrong, but uh, crucial days had been lost. Moreover, much has been left out of the files. Researchers hope the US and British governments will release further information, including pictures taken by Air Force personnel on the nights of the sightings. These are the only photographs that remain from the investigation. They show authorities examining the alleged landing site, but the pictures reveal no evidence of a landed craft. The U.S. Air Force's official stance is that the events were no threat to national security. To many, this statement doesn't ring true. If, in fact, nuclear weapons were housed at the base, then the military would have been very concerned about reports of an unidentified aircraft. We had objects flying over the weapon storage area, shining beams down to the ground. If that ain't defense significance, what is? Skeptics grapple with the same question, but in their minds, the military's response bolsters their claim that UFOs did not visit the Rendlesham Forest. 
This was during the Cold War. You have to realize that security was fairly tight. Anything that would happen uh, near the flight line when you have these high value of asset aircraft, tactical aircraft, or in weapons areas would immediately cause a response by the entire base. Everybody on the base would have been woken up and been reacting to something like that. And of course, that didn't happen. Even Charles Holt, the deputy base commander, is frustrated with his search for answers. I kept prodding Squadron Leader Moreland, the British liaison officer, for an answer. Doesn't somebody care? Doesn't, isn't somebody interested? I got the feeling that I was kind of left hanging out there to dry, if you know what I mean. Though they continue to press the government for more information, some researchers believe that the missing files and early mistakes in the military investigation may leave the Rendlesham case a lasting mystery. In any investigation, whatever you're investigating, if you don't, if you don't really use the first 24 hours to try and chase it down, your chances of success diminish rapidly. The problem with the Rendlesham incident is that this happened over the Christmas period. A lot of the key personnel were on leave, and uh, I th think there was a, a bit of a decision-making vacuum. The newly released information is not enough for the men involved at Rendlesham to put the incident to rest. For now, they possess the few pieces of intriguing evidence that remain from their strange encounter. Peniston's plaster casts and drawings Holtz tape recording. We're about 150 or 200 yards from the site. Everyone else is just deathly calm. Jim Penniston, Larry Warren, and John Burroughs continue to wonder why the government is hiding the truth. There's a chain of command, there's a chain of custody, everything's kept track of. And for this stuff to play it like it disappeared and it's gone, it's not. I guess technically we were part of a cover-up to ourselves. We probably started it by sanitizing it, the initial report. Like John Lennon used to say, conspiracy of silence speaks louder than words, and that's fact. And I'll be pissing off people as long as I can about this and screaming that uh, this went down, take a look at it, then judge for yourself. In America, everyone's heard of Roswell, but um, only the UFO uh, researchers really know about this case and yet in many ways I consider this case to be bigger than Roswell. This could be the biggest UFO incident of all time. Let's put it where it deserves to be. Let's put it in people's minds. People keep telling me, well what really happened? I don't know. What was it? I really don't know. I mean, I, I don't. <laughs>